Welcome to a care collab on the beautiful Dendrobium berry Oda. In my case, this is an update. Several channels are participating today, so thank you to all those that took the time to join in for your videos, for your information. Links to the channels that are participating are in the description with their videos on their berry Oda, how they grow them, where they grow them, and what they grow them in. So my berry Oda is not as spectacular as it has been in the past years because in 2021, it got reduced down to 50% of what it normally was. It was my big cleanup of 2021. Needless to say, she's in bloom and she is doing very, very well considering that radical process of dividing her. <laughs> One could actually say the massive intervention of 2021 did not phase this orchid whatsoever. The vigor of this orchid is stronger than any radical division that it went through. Thank goodness she handled all of that very, very well. But as another part of my update, I wanted to point out the keiki that started out as a flower spike, which I never removed. It has unfortunately dried up, even though it developed roots, I was hopeful that it would progress and form another growth. But we have another one on the go with beautiful roots coming. Maybe this time around, I will remove it prematurely and see if it will survive. Normally, if spikes that develop roots on these orchids are removed without another new growth starting, they wouldn't survive seeing as they don't have any leaves to photosynthesize. But we can see that even though I left that spike cakey hybrid on the mother plant, it just withered away. So I am thinking that once this other little spike cakey hybrid blooms out, I might just remove it and see what it does because those roots are just looking so gorgeous. While we're on the subject of keikis, I have three from last year that I want to grow on, two of which are in bloom. So let's have a look at blooms and do a comparison because I find this super interesting and I can actually demonstrate the difference in bloom color. And then we'll talk about light. There they are. There is no rhyme or reason as to why I set up the ones that I did the way I did. However, I always go with my classic favorite to have a little bit more of a humidity base I put in some hob material in this one and for reasons even unknown to me, I did an upside down bottle version right here without hob material, but it actually maintains a very humid environment in this base right here. And even that water is more condensation water than it is anything that I've put in. But this little keiki has as yet to wake up and produce a growth. Now. The blooms though, <laughs> I've got two keikis here, just with water that I kept topping up. I haven't really been using any fertilizer on these, but look at this. The vigor of this orchid is astounding. I absolutely love it. But here's what I wanted to point out. These keikis were cultivated indoors under quite low light levels in comparison to the mother plant. So they still got direct sun based on where they're living in the lower shelf, the angle of the sun being lower in the sky. But again, in comparison to the mother plant, low light. And look at the blooms. They are so cute. I still adore the color and the little speck of pink right at the end of the petals and sepals. But in contrast, check this out. That is incredible. Let's see if I can zoom in a bit. Can you see the difference when there is a lot of light on this orchid, how vibrant the colors of the blooms are in comparison to a bloom that didn't get that much light exposure? I wasn't even expecting these little keikis to bloom, but I think this makes a real valid point, how light influences the vibrancy and colors of the blooms. Amazing. Now, when we check out the blooms, it is undisputed that we have a lot of them. Thankfully, or unfortunately, depending on how you want to go at this, my berry Oda is blooming much, much sooner than it did in the previous years. We are now at the beginning of March. 
Usually this spectacle for me really comes into effect end of March, first week of April, when the sun is already out more consistently and I can smell the fragrance permeating through the breeze, whether I'm indoors or outdoors. However, the bloom longevity then only lasts about seven days to 10 days, seeing as the temperatures are warmer. So we have ourselves a little bit of a situation here. The orchid has bloomed out much, much sooner. The temperatures are still very, very low, and I'm now getting about 10 days, maybe two weeks out of every single bloom. And that for me is a first. This orchid has started to bloom out two weeks ago, and this morning was the first time I found the first spent bloom. So a little bit of yin and yang going on. I would prefer to have more of that gorgeous honeysuckle fragrance around my patio. And without the sun, it just doesn't manifest itself. But as a result of lower temperatures, I have my blooms for much, much longer. Plenty of spikes and buds yet to go. This is going to be good. Now, some of my spikes have frazzled out at the top, and I'm not surprised because I was quite frazzled with regards to my temperatures not rising fast enough. We've had some seriously gloomy weeks, and there's been a constant chill, in inverted commas, chill, that temperatures didn't really rise above 16 degrees Celsius. However, the nights never went to 5 degrees Celsius, which is what this orchid has tolerated in the past. Our lowest so far has been 8 degrees. Plenty cold for me, but in my climate, this orchid can live with those temperatures perfectly fine outdoors. I have her during the winter on my east-facing patio at the end of the patio table because the angle of the sun hits that area much, much quicker in the morning and then the orchid is in full sun until the sun goes past the corner of the building, putting the orchid into shade. Now, as the sun rises up in the sky, of course, it's going to get hotter and hotter and that is when I start to scoot the orchid towards the end of the table because the reflecting light of my facade still gives it a lot of light, but as the sun gets hotter, I don't want to be exposing it to that heat, especially as the wind will also start to warm up. So there is no reprieve for the orchid. So it gets scooted towards the end of the table where there will be much more shade until the angle of the sun is high enough and also hits that part of the table. And then the orchid gets moved somewhere where it's more protected in a more shady location. But since November, honestly, it's just been on the table. I've been fertilizing it because it was developing and maturing its growth from 2021. And then shortly after that, I could see spike nubbins starting. So the fertilization has been consistent throughout the winter. Seeing as it wasn't rapidly absorbing the reservoir, I've only fertilized at 160 parts per million. And also because my orchid is reduced to 50%, it doesn't need the 300 parts per million in the past. Now, let's see what it does in summer, because if it's starting to push out growths left, right and center, I may just bump it up to 300 parts per million again. The occasional rain that we have had, that has been its flush. I have not been flushing this orchid at all throughout the winter. It was fertilizer. And if it rained, well, great, so be it. Not that we had much rain. It never got to the point that the reservoir was flooded and I had to remove the mass. So what you're seeing here is what I consider the front of the orchid, the more lush side. And this is exactly the position I have her sitting on the table at. So the new part, the front part of the orchid is facing away from the light. Not only because of light training, but what I am trying to do is encourage the back of the orchid right here where she was divided and I exposed the center part, the older part of the orchid, I want this part to hopefully trigger new growths and start to fill in and give me some green new growths. You see how the canes are just bare and, you know, they're not at the point where I'm going to cut them away because they are great storage organs, but still it would be nice to have maybe three growths appear at this side, which is a possibility because this is where she was divided. So that's why I'm focusing the major part of the light on this side of the orchid, hopefully, to encourage growths and fill out this area. Now, having cooler temperatures, I haven't had as many issues with pests on this orchid, but I am seeing little white dots like these here. I just take a dry paintbrush and wipe them off. There is not much food around for pests, so anything colorful and beautifully smelling will attract aphids. Another one 
that I'm having difficulty with sometimes, not so much this year because these blooms are much sooner. I wonder if you can see the little black dots. Yeah, I check them and I make sure that I just brush them away. Now, unless I go in and squish them with my hand, they will return. But you know, at this point in time, this time of year, it's not really that busy a time for me with the orchids. They're pretty much just ticking over. So it's okay for me to check the blooms ever so often and make sure that the orchid is not being attacked too harshly, risking any blooms from just being decimated by pests. That is the update on my Dendrobium berryoda. One of my most favorite non-fuss orchids doesn't need much to end up looking like this. And who cannot appreciate that? Knowing what other orchids we are dealing with that require a lot more attention to perform. So I hope that you found this update interesting. If there's anything that I left out, please feel free to use the comments and bring that to my attention and I'll be happy to fill in the blanks. Thank you so very, very much for watching. Thank you once again to all the channels participating. Your time for watching, your time for your videos, very much appreciated. My Dendrobium Berry Oda and I, we will love and leave you. Have yourselves a beautiful day on one condition though, that you stay safe. Take care, bye.